keep on talking, I think, for the next seven minutes until we have people um, arriving at the appointed time. So why don't we write in the chat box where we are calling or dialing in or whatever the appropriate term is, where we're pinging in from. So just write in the chat which country or which city you're in. And I'll test my powers of reading and speaking at the same time. So the chat is empty at the moment. Ah, Esther, hello, South Korea. Somebody whose name I can't ring, can't read. South Korea, Germany, in Pamukkuren village. I in Turkey. Turkey, Chokki biliyorum. Okay, Turkey. Hello from Slovenia, Indonesia. Ah, wow, that's great. India, Neha Manik. Now that's a new name. Neha, are you a volunteer within the program? that I haven't met yet. That doesn't look like a very Indian name, so I'm immediately intrigued. Espanyo amigos. Hello, hi Andrew and Yuna, I am. Okay, that looks like Oscar from the tiny picture. I'm very good at recognizing people from tiny pictures. So Neha Manik says, interested in joining, sir. You never need to call me sir, Manik. Just Andrew is fine. But I've lived in South Asia. I've lived in Bangladesh for seven years. And I know that everyone calls everyone sir. Ji sir, ji sir, all the time. So I'm very familiar with that. But it's good that you're here, Neha. Is that a man's name or a woman's name? I would guess a woman's name, but I may be wrong. Maybe you can enlighten me in the comments. So we have, yes, Indonesia. I think I know who that is. So, ah, ha, G, <laughs> female name. I thought so. Okay. And which part of India are you, Neha? Big country. Are you north, south? Ah, yes. Espanyol amigos. I recognized you. Paula. Hi, Paula. Lucknow. I know Lucknow very well. I even worked in the Montessori school in Lucknow for three weeks. And I have friends in Lucknow. So, it's very lucky that you said Lucknow because I like that city very much. I know India quite well. I went to many cities from Shimla to Darjeeling, to Delhi, to Kolkata, to Jaipur, to Udaipur, to um, Jodhpur, uh, Madras, or Chennai. I've been to many, many cities in India. Beautiful country. Very interesting place. Wow! Oh my God! You study in the same school. I remember when I was there, this would have been 2000... I'm keeping an eye on the clock, but this is just the preliminary... When I was in that school, it would have been 2006 or seven, and the headmaster was quite an interesting character, quite strict, but obviously he ran a very tight ship, uh, and he made his school uh, a very famous school throughout India. But I remember being quite impressed, or maybe even awestruck by his character. I can't remember his name, but I certainly remember his aura. So that's amazing. But I spent three weeks there on a summer course working with teachers. So how many are we in the room? 13 so far. We have five likes. People have liked this already. That's amazing. I haven't said anything yet. It's very kind, very generous of you to like. Six likes. Oh, my God. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> Stop, li stop, <laughs> stop liking. Hi. Oh, it's Edit. Hi, Edit. An old favorite of the program. Not old in the sense of years, but an old friend, an old favorite of Bros Pro Bono. And even before that, 
of the pros group on Facebook. So, well, it's nice to see people here for more. I've never done one of these before. This is quite exciting to be able to speak to the camera, have my microphone working, check the numbers, check the time, and um, look at the chat and try and keep on top of that at the same time. I suspect I've seen people uh, doing this kind of talk on things like Bitcoin, for example, where there are thousands, and I've seen political YouTubes where there are thousands of people who are tuned in and all of them commenting, at which point it becomes far too fast and too difficult to keep on top of everything. But we'll see. We'll see if I can keep on top of the comments today. So it's very exciting to have that kind of feeling of liveness. And we have our live sessions every week in open house. But there's something kind of quite immediate, quite buzzy about this new, at least for me. I know there are YouTubers out there with billions of fans. Uh, so we're not in that category. But it's something quite exciting to see how this works in real life. So we're now 429. And I should share with you that I haven't prepared what I'm going to say, but it'll come out anyway. I talk about pro bono and I live and breathe pro bono. So I'm not expecting to have writer's block or speaker's block. And uh, looking forward to interacting with people. So if you've just joined, write your uh, place of origin or the place where you are right now in the comments. And for those who've joined already, thank you for being there. Uh, this is our first attempt at doing a, a YouTube live. Thank you to Chinti for setting this all up. Chinti is an expert on all things YouTube. And so I'm very much a student here learning how these things work. Okay, so I'm going to start talking right now about pro bono. And I want you, even if you're familiar with the program, just to think of any questions you have, anything that you've thought about in the past, not necessarily about the procedures maybe, although that's also possible. Oh, we have Mariana from Buenos Aires. Welcome, uh, Mariana. So um, if you have any questions, no matter how challenging, because I love challenging questions, because all the questions about how does it work, how do I join, I've answered many, many times, and I'm happy to answer them again. But what I'm really interested in is things that push me to think about this from a new angle. Like when people come up and challenge to say, why are you working for free? Or why are you encouraging people to give away the work for free? They're not easy questions, but they're often interesting questions because they make your mind stretch a little bit. And just like going to the gym is not always pleasant, but always beneficial, mind-stretching questions are also very uh, beneficial in the long run. Okay, so pros pro bono. Let's look at the name first of all. Pros comes from pros.com, which is the world's largest um, organization marketplace for teachers. I've just seen a very interesting question from Yuna, which I'm going to put in my mental fridge for one minute and then come back to it. So pros.com is the parent company and they have essentially paid for pro bono to set up because even though we are made up of volunteers and our costs are low, I have a salary and Chinti has a salary and we use equipment and subscriptions to things like ChatGPT, for example, to keep our operations going. And of course, we have a website, we have a dashboard, all of these things need to be paid for and pros have been very generous in doing that. And then why pro bono? Because we talk often about voluntary work and until now, until now I use the word every day millions of times, of course, but I would have put pro bono in the legal or medical category before and I would have said voluntary work for the rest of us. But Henry's idea was very much to associate the work of translators with the world of lawyers and doctors and give it that extra professional 
touch. So instead of saying pros.com volunteers or pros volunteers or pros vol or anything like that, he wanted pro bono to be in the title. It's a Latin phrase. It means for the public good. And therefore, it's come to mean work which is free of charge. So let me ask... Um, no, the open house, there's two questions here. One from Yuna, what surprised me most? I think what surprised me most is the growth of the program uh, since the beginning. So it's now two years old, started almost exactly two years ago today. And in those first days, when it was only me with well, not even any volunteers on the first day, but then a handful of volunteers, because I have quite a big network in the translation field. And luckily, enough of them were willing to come and test out this new thing with me that I ended up with 30 or 40 or 50 volunteers after a couple of days, but no clients. And there were days at the beginning, like any new freelancer starting out on a career, where I genuinely thought this was going to be very hard and even impossible. There were days when I would went online and looked at 50 organizations against racism, for women, uh, for medical care, for refugees. And I wrote them very passionate, sincere emails to all of them, and not one of them responded. And for reasons that we talked about in the session earlier this afternoon, maybe because we were too new, they were too busy, all kinds of things didn't happen. Uh, but that left me, as you can imagine, in the first couple of months, feeling that this would be impossible to get off the ground. Also aware that we were a very tiny player in a room with a big elephant in it. And I mean that in the most complimentary sense. Elephants are beautiful animals. Translators Without Borders is an elephant. They started off, I think, because the boss worked closely with... Um, Médecins Sans Frontières, which is Doctors Without Borders. So they were working, I think, in the same office or next door to each other. And so immediately they started off with a massive dossier of things to translate. And they went from strength to strength. We started off with nothing. And I was very aware of how on earth are we going to get to the kind of level where we can be on a similar playing field. But very early on in our process, I decided that maybe what we needed to do was not a smaller version of that, but something quite different. And that's what I think we've built. Esther asks, is this like the open house meetings? No, the open house meetings are uh, basically 20 or 30 people on a screen having like a Zoom call, essentially. So it's not just me talking all the time. There, everyone gets a talk. Sometimes I talk more than others if I've got something to share that particular week, but most of the time it's an idea which we, we start and then volunteers make their own um, make their own discussion and we all chip in. So just to circle back to Yuna's comment, so the most surprising thing then is having started off with that very humble beginning is how much it's grown and how much, because we decided to invest in the human side and give time through the newsletter, which takes a few hours each week, through the open house um, and through other initiatives, how that has repaid itself a hundred times over and how from being like a small language agency, we've become a much bigger language agency, but we've become much more than that. We've become a community, which I am told, I don't really know, but Translators Without Borders is less of a community because they simply don't encourage interaction between their translators. I know for a fact that when I worked for them, I never met another translator working for them. I could see them on the website. I could see their tallies and their totals, but I never really interacted with other volunteers. And I never really interacted with the program either because I was assigned work, sent, did the work, sent it back in, felt very good about it, and then it went back into them. And I think I got a thank you email each time. But then there was no attempt. That's not the way they did things to reach out and try and put me in touch with other translators. And from the very beginning, 
that community aspect, that um, social aspect, human aspect, and the developmental aspect, because people learn when they come together in groups. And because we're social tribal animals, I thought from the very beginning, we would try and cultivate that and make it into something um, that was a more central part of the program. And that's the way it's become. So the effects of that are the biggest surprise for me, how we've now got ambassadors and ninjas and crews and people in 108 languages and people from some of the poorest countries in the world all stepping up and devoting time and going beyond what they're asked to do. That's the biggest and the most joyful surprise for me. Okay, so let me look at another question. Um, okay, so Oscar asks, what was my inner motivation or my personal experience? That's a very good question. Um, it's a mixture of things. First of all, it was, I was already working at pros.com and I would, I'd been, so this motivation works on, on several levels. On a very selfish level, I had been uh, operating and running the pros.com Facebook group for three years and I was a little bit tired of doing that because it was the same questions coming up and as you know probably in any community of 80,000 people which is what that group is it was 25,000 when I started off it was about 60,000 when I finished that's a lot of people to manage and whereas volunteers are all lovely kind and happy people it seems to me if you've got a group, a cross-section of the translator community, you've got a much wider range of people, some of whom are very kind and positive, others of whom are argumentative, others of whom are downright nasty, and some people are very pessimistic. So you've got this entire range of human natures in one group, which means that you have to do a much more active job, like a school teacher, of managing the group. And I did that for three years. I was quite, I used to be a school teacher. I found that role something quite comfortable to step into. But I definitely was beginning to feel the strain after three years and thinking, okay, we've talked about agencies. We've talked about direct clients. We've talked about you should charge more to your clients. We've talked about don't send an email to any client saying I can do every subject from archery to zoology. So, I felt like I'd been through all of the themes around freelancing. And by that stage, so two years ago, I'd been writing for eight years every day online about being a freelancer. So I'd been around the houses, as we say, and I'd basically seen everything, written everything, read everything that there was to write about um, freelancing. So... A small part of my motivation was, get me out of here. I need to do something new. And then Henry came along with this offer at that exact moment. But I think that would be to do a disservice to the fact that all my life, I have been what we might call socially engaged. So I've been somebody who comes from a culture in South Wales, which was an industrial left-wing culture. So a culture which was very egalitarian where people looked after each other, where unlike maybe in some parts of England, there was no rigid class system. Everybody was pretty much the same. Some people had more money or more status because they were doctors or lawyers, but we didn't have aristocrats in Wales. We didn't have lords and ladies and the whole Downton Abbey thing going on. So I came from that culture where I was taught as a child that everybody has equal value and that some people are less fortunate in their lives uh, and that's not because they didn't try as hard but because circumstances dictate in many ways the fabric of our lives and as a result of that I grew up as a student very aware of social inequalities of injustices, of the fact that people 
are often discriminated against for no reason. I was very aware as a student of racism. At that time, South Africa was the big issue, a bit like maybe Gaza and Israel today, but South Africa and apartheid was the number one issue for students in the 80s when I was a student. So I heard, I went on many demonstrations in London because I was a student in Oxford. London was one hour away. And I went on demonstrations against apartheid. I read books about apartheid. I listened to South African music. Uh, I knew everything about Mandela, about Oliver Tambo, about the great leaders of that time. I even read literature from South Africa. And that experience of being a student and fighting for causes which were obviously um, worthwhile causes stuck with me. And even though I've become older and a bit more comfortable in my circumstances in life, um, you know, I've had good jobs, I've been well paid, I've had a relatively successful career, I've never lost sight of the fact that there are people in the world who are going through hell on a daily basis. That might be as women within a household in certain countries or in any country. That might be as children who are suffering from abuse. It might be as whole groups of people, you know, black people in the UK or in the US or Asian people. That might be because of uh, climate disasters. And of, obviously it's difficult for a single person or for any of us to bear all that weight on our shoulders. But it feels really good for me to be involved in that world, to at least have the impression that with all of us together, that we're making some kind of contribution. So every day when I go on our Instagram, which has now been revived and is doing very well, I see um, all of our clients are also posting on Instagram. So I'm seeing uh, clips and photos from Africa, from Asia, about women, about violence, about uh, gender issues, about sexual discrimination, about um, people living in poverty, people who've got no homes, people who've got no insurance, people who are in rich countries but suffering, people who are in poor countries and suffering for different reasons or sometimes the same reasons. A lot in our feed as pros pro bono because we don't follow translators, we follow our clients. So a lot about the climate crisis, global warming. Um, so when I open up Instagram every single day, rather than feeling overwhelmed by what we call doom scrolling, I don't know if you know this word, doom, obviously from impending doom, but doom scrolling is basically looking through your phone and going from one disaster to another. But instead of feeling depressed by that, I kind of think, let's do something. We're making a difference. And so every day now, I wake up thinking, okay, let's get to work. There's things to be done. And so for me personally, that has totally changed my attitude to work. Instead of thinking, right, how can I manage 80,000 translators who want to kill each other today or who want to express their frustrations? And I understand, I get it, that translators are often um, living in difficult circumstances, especially with the, ra the rise of AI, the rise of machine translation. Um, people are often looking for more and more people looking for less and less work. And I get that it's frustrating, although those frustrations have been there ever since I joined the world of translation online, which leads me to think that maybe those frustrations are more to do with people's attitude to life than they are to external circumstances. Sure, things are hard, but then translators were frustrated in 2010 when I first came, or 2014, when I first went online, there were people complaining left, right, and center. And that was way before AI, at the very beginning of MT, when there were agencies sending lots 
of work. So I began to formulate a theory that maybe it's about our attitude as much as external circumstances. And maybe two translators who arrive in the same city on the same day will have very different experiences of that city depending on the attitude they bring and the events they draw towards themselves and the people they draw towards themselves will be a reflection of the attitude and energy that they bring. And I find that with pro bono has been proved to me a hundred times. So I bring a certain energy, enthusiasm, openness to my work every day. And as a result, we're attracting some of the very best people I've met in my life to play key roles within our project. So a very long answer to Oscar's question. So the motivation came partly from changing my role, which I wasn't very happy with. But much more than that, it comes from a connection to this wider world, a feeling that we're all in this together, that it's not them and us, but only us. And that even to an extent, the us includes animals and includes the planet, and that we have to work through this together, not by creating divisions, which people like Elon Musk are very happy to do, Certain politicians on the world stage are happy to sow division. I kind of think we're all in this together and we need to be working uh, a lot more on the various problems together. Very long answer. Okay. So, uh, let me ask. Stasha Sierhovsky says, how often do I hear um, questions like, why why do you want to work for free and how and you get tired of them well the funny thing is it's a question that i expected to hear quite a lot but i haven't heard very much um i think i shared an article this morning in our network about one of the accusations leveled at translated third borders was that they were charging certain clients for their services but then not paying volunteers um, and then that inevitably opens up the accusation, well, why aren't you passing that money on? Well, in our case, we are, I'm being paid by pros.com, which is being paid by members, but nobody, no client is ever paying us anything and no client is asked to pay. And if we do, when we do, raise funds in the future, this will be from donors who see an interest in supporting the work that we do because we tell them a compelling story. And that will be the key to raising money because there's lots of money out there and that money will go into making the program better and to growing our team because we've already seen that with the arrival of Chinti, this has been a huge difference, freeing up all the admin work for me to get on with more creative work and when we have new members joining the team, like Anna, who will come in for fundraising in September, for example, that will enable us to increase our work and therefore increase our impact. So with all of that in mind, the fact that we don't charge the clients, it's a much easier question to answer. Why do we work for free? Well, because we don't take money from the clients and we belong to their voluntary world. Um, it would be much more difficult to answer if we were charging and spending the money on holidays in Tahiti, which we're not doing, obviously. So it's not a question I hear that much. I haven't come across much opposition. Maybe there are little corners of the internet where people are muttering darkly, pro bono, pro bono, pro bono. Um, I haven't been exposed to that. And I keep my eyes fairly open um, and nobody has written to me or I've never seen any comments online criticizing the work that we do. So touch wood. Um, it's a program which is seen positively. And so I haven't had a chance yet to get tired of that question. Esther asks, how are we filtering the organizations? 
Do you think that there are some organizations that can afford to pay for translations? Well, I'm not privy to the finances of each organization. So the only thing I can do is meet up with the clients face to face and test them and ask them why it is they're not able to pay. And in a way, unless they're all very skilled uh, liars or manipulators, I simply have to trust what they're saying to me. Now, if you take an example that I gave earlier of a Guatemalan charity run by two Americans, it's clear that they don't have money. You know, all the money they have goes into providing materials for kids in Guatemala and maybe to sending teachers over, maybe paying their flight or paying their accommodation. And those teachers are the ones who do the work. So our job is to help these organizations do the work that they are trying to do. For those small operations, it's a pretty easy choice. It's clear they don't have money. I'm speaking to them. They're working in a tiny office on the back bedroom of their house. And it, it's pretty obvious. When I meet organizations like the International Rescue Committee, like the like UNESCO, or even the UN itself in Argentina, then I do ask that question. I say, so what have you done in the past? And why are you unable to pay for translations now? Because I want, naturally, to defend the interests of translators. If they can pay, then maybe they should pay, even if they're doing good work. And I don't want to be accused in any way, not that anybody has done this, but accused of exploiting the goodwill of translators. But even when we meet these people, even the UN, the story is always the same. They say that we had a budget and it's being cut back. And I came across this recently when I worked for with our volunteers for the International Rescue Committee. Very prestigious client, uh, a very important client in the US with offices across the, the, in all 50 states, dealing with vast numbers of refugees coming to the US. And I met up with a guy who was running a newly established language unit. Because as you can imagine, with any big organization like that one with offices in 50 states, there's a lot of overlap, a lot of reinventing the wheel, a lot of people doing stuff which could easily have been translated because another office already had the translation. And yet both offices were coming to me independently. And I was saying, you should talk to California because they've got this text. And we did that last week. But there's lack of coordination. And that's almost inevitable when these organizations reach this tentacular, like an octopus, a tentacular level. So I meet this guy. He seems very impressive. And we're talking about how we can coordinate and how his language unit can pull these threads together. And we had a meeting once a month for six months um, in which he said, right, now requests should come through me. Now we can use this software. Now we can use this translation memory. And it was interesting and educative for me to be able to work with this guy and see how he was managing a vast language operation within a single organization. Until two months ago, he came to the meeting and he was looking very glum. And I said, you know, what's up? I got to know him quite well by now. And he said, um, our unit has been axed. I was really surprised. And I said, what's happening? He said, well, budget, budget cuts. So when an organization like that gets less money from the government and their budget is cut by 20%, then they have to cut some services. And often, as we know, translation is seen as a luxury, even though it shouldn't be. It's pretty essential to the work that our clients are doing. Um, so that was the story with the IRC. I heard the same thing with UNESCO. Yes, we used to be able to pay, but we've got no budget anymore. 
The same thing with the UN, even in Argentina. So then it's up to me to decide, are these people lying to me? Are they telling the truth? If they're telling the truth, should things not be different? Maybe they should get more money from the government. Maybe, but they're not getting it. So on each call, it is literally a judgment call where I'm speaking to the client and thinking, okay, do these people, they don't have to start crying during our phone call. But I'm judging all the time. Yeah, these people sound like they're committed to their work. I'm meeting them face to face on Zoom. Uh, they sound committed, they sound engaged, but it's clear that they're having trouble doing what they're doing. And in that case, I can decide whether or not. And usually the answer is yes to work with them. It's not a science, it's more of an art, but it's one, and it's not objective in the sense that I can't see their books. But I'm pretty content that most of the organizations that we work with if you put those big ones to one side, most of the ones we work with are doing good work on the ground and doing very important work. So for me, it follows naturally that we can do work with them. Okay, hope that answers your question, Esther. Um, oh, reap goodness. So there's Carol. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you again, Carol. Um, well, that, that's, that's the kind of comment that Carol has written here from Reap Goodness, uh, she's involved in environmental work, that we often get. The standard response from clients when I meet them, and personally, I don't like the word clients. If one day I become the ruler of everything, which I'm not quite at the moment, I would call all of our clients partners because we are partnering them, really, in delivering services to their beneficiaries. So for me, it's volunteers, partners, beneficiaries. Client sounds a little bit too corporate or business-like for me. But anyway, so Reap Goodness is a partner. And like all partners, when we meet them, first of all, and we describe what we do, they say, it's too good to be true. Almost as if to say, where's the catch? Um, and I say, there is no catch. This really is free. It really is um, quality service and we can vouch for that so it's not too good to be true it's just very good and very true that's my standard answer so I'm glad um, that Carol that you're here to express that on behalf of all our partners so from Indonesia we have a question as to whether there's a risk in translating political content okay so this is a more sensitive issue. We have eight categories of humanitarian content, which go from saving the environment, everyone agrees with that, to helping refugees, again, well, not everyone agrees, but we all agree with that. I mean, refugees, if you go to the UK, the US, don't always meet with a fantastic welcome from happy, smiling people. They often find some people like that, but there are also people in opposition. Um, but when we work to support women and girls, that's pretty unambiguously accepted, apart from by certain men. And there are famous men out there. You might have heard of Andrew Tate, who spread misogyny online. So he would very much not approve of our work to empower women for example. But by and large, most of the causes we deal with, from the environment to providing health, to providing education, to helping refugees, to helping the poor, are universally approved of. We have one organization called Progressive International, and the clues in the title. So in the States right now, and in the West generally, the word progressive is a kind of opposite to conservative, okay? And Progressive International, they ask tough questions about the world in which we live. They say, okay, there's a famine in Ethiopia or in Sudan or in Somalia right now. 
So obviously that's an emergency situation where we need to provide support. That support might be in the form of food or shoes or lentils or clothes or whatever. That's emergency aid to deal with the crisis. But when these crises keep on popping up again and again, we also need people, I think, to ask, why do these things keep happening? Why is there famine in Ethiopia? Why is the climate changing in this way? Why are there people in the States, I mean, not just in Africa or Asia, people in the States who cannot have access to decent food? Why is the food industry pumping people full of sugar and salt, for example? Why have obesity levels literally exploded since the 1970s? Why is there conflict in Yemen? Why is there a problem between Russia and Ukraine? What are the underlying causes that lead to the crises that we then have to pick up the mess after every time? And I think personally that we don't want to be doing only that because we want to teach maths and we want to plant trees. We want to take action. But I think there's a place in our ecosystem for asking and for helping organizations that want to ask those tough questions. Because if we don't ask the questions as to why racism is perpetuated, for example, if we think back to Black Lives Matter, if we think back to black people who were killed by police kneeling on their necks, for example, in the case of George Floyd, if we don't ask those questions, and we, we don't ask questions about gun ownership, then we're simply walking blindly into the next shooter, shootout in a school. And then everyone gets very sad, everyone gives thoughts and prayers, and everyone says this should never happen until the next time it happens. So I think it's very important that we have one or two organizations in our stable of partners who ask tough questions. They may not be able to change the world in the same way as people who purify water or who plant trees or who create crops or who teach children. But I think they form an important part of the mosaic. Now, by definition, once you begin to ask questions about why is this happening, why are some people behind this, why are other people against this, it becomes political with a small p. We certainly don't support any political parties, but we do engage with one or two organizations like that who ask tough questions. And it's up to volunteers whether they want to translate that content. So as it happens, progressive international articles, because they're well written and they're journalistic in tone, are very, very, very popular with volunteers. But everyone is free to say, I don't like that article. I don't want to translate that content. In the case of a country like Brazil, you have a leader like Bolsonaro and a leader like Lula who represent very different political factions, different attitudes. And any article discussing the history of Brazil in recent times is by definition going to be political because it's either going to support one and therefore be against the other or vice versa. So I wouldn't say we seek out political content, but neither do we refuse to translate it, especially when these bigger questions are concerned. We're not going to translate articles about the American election or the British election, but when people ask why is there economic injustice in parts of the world, why in countries where there are rich natural resources like the Congo or Nigeria, is there such poverty, then I think those questions are worth engaging with. So, right, well, that's a lovely comment from Yuna. I think you reach, you make an important point that you've grown professionally and never felt like you're being exploited. Because I think from the beginning, when we realized that 
Um, we were a tiny organization compared to the elephant that was and is Translators Without Borders. Not just in reaction to that, but also as a reflection of the way that I wanted this to go, we decided to become more community-based and more human. So more human touches in reaching out to volunteers, recognizing people's names, their faces, having open house, having newsletters, trying to create a community spirit because I believe that people work better when they work together. And as we all know, translation is an isolated and isolating profession. And all my translation life, or at least for the last 10 years, has been based on the understanding that people need to reach out and work together. Otherwise, loneliness, whether in the first world or, or in the global north or the global south, loneliness can be a real issue. So we decided to bring translators together, and that has become one of the most beautiful parts of the project. A second thing we've done is move from a position where we said we need to revise texts to make sure that we're not sending badly translated work to partners. That was the first motivation behind creating a translator plus reviewer system. But as that began to kick in and take shape, we realized there's a lot more, there's a lot uh, more that, that's rich and developmental that can be done within that system. So that, for example, at the very least, you would have translator A would send their text back to me. I would send that off to reviewer A, who would then send me back the finished copy that would go to the client. Now that would be the most efficient and shortest way to get around the quality problem. So one translator, one reviewer, they don't talk because that's just a waste of time. They send their stuff back to me, I send the, to the, the client. But from the beginning, we wanted the experience of translating and revising to be richer than that. So that the translator not only makes mistakes, if they make any at all, but learns from their mistakes and becomes a better translator. And that the reviewer, because reviewing is a separate job in the commercial world, the reviewer not only reviews, but also has to account for their reviews to the translator, which requires a whole bunch of analytical, linguistic, and diplomatic skills to come into play. And so through that interaction, the translator learns to become a better translator, the reviewer becomes a better reviewer, and also a better human being in some ways because they're giving a feedback and they're trying to do so in a way that encourages the translator to grow. And then they're having to deal maybe with some pushback from the translator who might say, I don't agree with all your changes. Then it's up to the reviewer to say, okay, let's compromise. Or to justify and say, well, look, if you look at this book or that website, you'll see why I made this choice. So that dialogue between translator and reviewer is, for me, a really key part. And another thing which has been, you know, to come back to Yuna's question, quite surprising has been to see the maturity of that discussion and the the way in which um, people have really taken each other's feelings into consideration and yet been unafraid to be quite firm and quite um, proactively uh, directive in their comments so that when a translation has not been done to the standard that we expect, then I expect the reviewer to share that politely with the translator, which might mean saying, have a look at your work, you'll see some changes, and then the translator opens up the work and there are six million changes. And then in an ideal world, the translator would say, 
Okay, that wasn't my best work. Thank you for the correction. In a neutral world, the translator will open that and think, hmm, and then go and hide and not say anything. And in a less than ideal world, the translator will fire off a volley of abuse at the reviewer saying, who do you think you are? I've been translating for 15 years. I've never had comments like this before. So all of those situations are possible in that interaction. But from what I've seen of dialogue between translator and reviewer, that's been very, very diplomatically and maturely handled. And that's been another source of joy to me is to see these people really working together because the top translators in our industry if you think of people like Chris Durbin, have always said that a translator should work with a reviser. But in the commercial world, as we all know, sometimes there's no time. And if you're working for a certain rate, uh, for an agency, you might think it's their job to check the work. And you're certainly not going to take some money out of your fee and pay for a reviser. So for all kinds of reasons, we don't get revised most of the time. And we only hear feedback when it's negative. So this has been one of the, the best parts of the project for me. It's been watching that relationship between translators and revisers grow. So let's have a look. So Kim Yoon Jin, I hope I pronounced that correctly, from Seoul, South Korea. Do I need to be a professional translator to volunteer? Uh, no, I mean... In most countries, one can become a professional translator simply by waking up one morning and saying, I'm now a professional translator. So freelance translation in many countries is not regulated. So the moment you wake up and put on a nice shirt and say, I'm a translator, then in some senses, you have become a professional translator, especially the moment somebody starts to pay you for your work. Um, you need to have a pros profile to join our system, but that can be done in 25 minutes for free on pros.com. So that's the minimum that you need because without a profile, we can't locate you within the system. We can't allocate work to you. Um, if your question is more to do with, do I need experience? Then I would say the answer is no. The very reason we have reviewers and the very reason we ask for reviewers to have three plus years of experience is because there might be people who are coming along for the first time and doing their first translation, they might have a lot to learn. And therefore, um, we pair them up with a reviewer. So I would say you don't have to be a professional. You don't have to be experienced. You do have to be open to feedback because if it's your first ever translation and you react hysterically or angrily to any feedback well then probably it's not for you but i would say in that case maybe even translation is not for you so if people come with an open mind and they're prepared to give it their best shot and deliver the best quality they can do and be open to feedback then I would say you'd be welcome with open arms. Of course, if a new translator delivers a text to an experienced reviewer and the text is full of mistakes, that is probably going to come back to me because I ask reviewers not to tell tales, but simply to report to me if there's someone who's so way off the mark that this is creating more work than it solves, then I need to know. And that's particularly the case if a new translator delivers work which clearly has not been spell-checked. And spell-check is something that's available to everyone. It's a key part of our work. So if a translator delivers clearly Google-translated material or material that is full of spelling mistakes, then that becomes a problem for us and we might well uh, deselect that translator. But if you're starting out and you make a few honest mistakes, but your work is sincere and good, then there's absolutely no problem. Um, 
So, Stasha, again, talking about not having had any work yet. So, unless I'm mistaken, Stasha, you are Croatian or Serbian language. So, it's true that in some languages, Hungarian, um, Finnish, for example, we don't get many um, requests for work. But, uh, same with Bosnian, same with Montenegro, and all the languages of the former Yugoslavia, for example. But as we take on more and more clients, then we our our demand for new languages uh, is always increasing. We've got 108 languages in our entire list, um, and I think we must have used. You know, even for short texts, about 70 or 80 of those. So there's no language too small uh, or very few languages which are too small uh, for us to even be able to use those translators. Yes, great comment from Lindsay. Again, a very positive uh, experience of reviewing. And that's that, that's wonderful to read. And it's very important because I want also people to enjoy this experience and to feel like they're getting something out of it and not just putting a lot into it because that is clearly the case. So Edit asks a very interesting question. What would make me quit? Um, a nuclear bomb. Um, short of a nuclear bomb, nothing at the moment. I can quite honestly say this is the, the most satisfying job I've ever had. Uh, I feel that it uses all parts of me. I've always had this theory that each of us as human beings were like diamonds. And we've got many, many facets to our character and many skills in our skill set. Many strings to our bow is an English expression. And I think that the best jobs are the jobs which exercise every part of you. Like going to the gym shouldn't only exercise one arm, it should exercise your whole body. And I think the perfect job is one which calls on all your skills. So if I can be immodest for a moment, I can say that I'm skilled as a translator, but not as skilled as many people I've met. I'm skilled as a mobilizer of people. That's obvious by now. All my groups on Facebook and this program. I'm skilled as a writer. Although without Lindsay, my writing would be full of typos because I'm also very, a bit too fast as a writer. Um, I am skilled as a teacher. When I say skilled, I don't mean hugely skilled. I mean, I have that in a way that I don't have carpentry or plumbing or flying planes in my skill set. So I do have writing, mobilizing people, motivating people, communicating, organizing, uh, some design skills. My mother is a designer, so I've got some of that aesthetic skill from her, which comes out in the newsletters or in the website, which I designed, that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, maybe uh, a a skill in or is that all of them yeah maybe also an interpersonal skill in dealing with with new clients who come along not sure what they're going to get and yet you know they meet me and then they become clients okay so while I might not be the best in the world at any one of those skills taken individually if you put them together where they all get used in this job, then you become much, much stronger. And you can say, I might not be the best translator in the world, I'm not the best program director in the world, but I'm much better in this role because it uses all of these skills together. And for that reason, I mean, when I was a translator, maybe the teaching part of me was languishing, unused, in the weeds. When I was a teacher of English, the language learning part of me or the translation part of me, which I didn't know existed, 
wasn't being used that much. Um, when I was a writer, I used to be a journalist. Then I wasn't using my people mobilization skills. So in this job, I get to use all of them. And for that reason, I will never quit until they push me over the side of the ship. Um, okay, thanks, Tasha, for the uh, clarification. Yes, I totally agree with Marina's comment um, about the dialogue, uh, the language issues, and also, you know, talking about the content. I think we get some very, very interesting content to read and very worthwhile content. I keep on comparing it to when I would wake up and be asked to translate some shoe catalog. And you might love shoes. Maybe you have 300 shoes in your wardrobe. But for me, that was always less interesting and less worthwhile than the kind of translation we're doing every day here. So Sylvia says, the quality of human connection. I love the way that uh, YouTube lights up pros pro bono in red. It makes this a program where I'm truly happy to collaborate. Wonderful. Lindsay says, Andrew, you are also really approachable and generally want to see us translate this grow. Well, I hope to be. I hope to be approachable. Um, I don't have a huge uh, ego. Or at least maybe my, my wife would say that I do. But genuinely speaking, generally in work, no, I genuinely do like watching other people succeed. Um, I, when I run groups online, I always used to look at people saying things like, oh, this is going to be some shameless self-promotion. That was the phrase people used. Now I'm going to do some, some shameless self-promotion. And I always thought, why on earth should self-promotion be shameful? If you've got something, tell other people about it. Share it. That's always been my principle. Uh, it's what I've done on my personal page on Facebook. It's what I've done in this program. Everyone should be sharing their successes, not shoving them down other people's throats, maybe, and not talking only about their own successes. But I think a world in which people celebrate what's going right for them is a much happier world than where people just point out problems all the time. So, yes, I hope to remain approachable. It's not something I have to think about consciously. It's just I genuinely enjoy watching people grow and especially within this program i enjoy the global nature so just now i was on the the phone this afternoon to a client whose name was raven as in the bird but she was filipina living in washington dc and every time the screen opens and there's a new person black white asian whatever they are however old they are uh, whatever color they are whatever gender or sexuality they are, I don't care. You're looking at a human being, and I love that sense of being connected with the whole world. And I feel that when I was a translator from French to English, you know, my world was French clients. French clients marketing French things to English people or English speakers. And now, when I come to work each day, you know, those little narrow national walls have exploded and now i'm thinking okay nigeria philippines sri lanka lithuania egypt china taiwan thailand and just thinking of all these places where we're having daily contact and for me that's personally again one of the greatest benefits of working in uh, pros pro bono uh, then neha asks, Neha from Lucknow, says, do you provide any training? Well, we do provide, actually, um, two kinds of training. There are training guides for when people join the program. And I'd like, Neha, if you can, for you to tell us how you came across this YouTube today. Did you see it on the pros page or did you simply stumble across it on YouTube? And thank you for staying with us throughout the session. Um, so we have these guides at the beginning, which give people all the steps they need to know before they uh, start translating. So we have three or four guides like that. 
um, and a code of ethics, which people need to sign up to. Uh, and then we're in the process of putting together training for all new volunteers, which we're calling onboarding, which is a slightly more in-depth video-based training and PDF-based training on the things that you need to know to be a member of Pro Bono, but also to be a humanitarian translator, even to be a translator, because everything we do here is also applicable to other uh, aspects of translation. So that's great. A, a friend suggested to me, we have some great volunteers in India and looking forward to expanding you know, beyond Hindi. We do Hindi, we do Gujarati, we've done Tamil, we've done Telugu. So we've done quite a few um, Indian languages. Uh, and then, are there any opportunities to do pro bono game localization or subtitling? Well, we've, we've been asked to do uh, a gamification project, but not a video game. It's uh, one of our clients called Ma Petite Planet have ecological environmental challenges which take the form of games which clients um, and schools and organizations can then do. But we haven't yet been asked to do specific uh, localization for games. But I don't think that's necessarily far away because as NGOs also develop and get in touch with new technologies, I'm pretty sure some of them soon will be developing. We've already done quite a few video subtitles, but I'm sure uh, our clients whose messaging is also developing fast and becoming more and more slick uh, will turn to us sooner or later for um, subtitling and localization work. So now it's almost half past. Now it's exactly half past. So I'm going to say thank you to all of you. It's been great fun trying to keep on top of the comments, talking to you through the camera up there and looking at the number of people. Great fun. We'll do this again in future. Thank you to Chinti for setting this up. And for those who are still up for more, like me, come and join us in half an hour in the open house. And I'm going to add the link for open house, if I can see it. People like Neha, who have not seen or been to an open house, you're not obliged to come, of course, but you might want to come. Let me just find the link here. Okay, yeah. So it's here. That is the the link. Open house is just literally like a Zoom call with anybody who comes where we talk about lots of aspects of the project and sometimes just chat, sometimes we think about you know an issue that we all need to tackle, whatever. It's always very informal, very friendly, and great fun and a learning experience for all of us. So thank you very much for coming, and I'll see you in open house in about half an hour if you want to come along there. Bye-bye for now.